Just a quick note of thanks to Ruth for lighting our chalice this morning and to Kristen for uh, doing our reading. Uh, thanks to both of them for saying yes when I asked them. So if you're like me, you probably know the outlines of the second half of the 20th century in America. World War II ended in 1945, followed by 20 years of the Cold War, which began in 1947. And this coincided with the most significant economic growth in the history of the country, maybe the history of the world. Millions were lifted out of poverty by the availability of decent paying jobs in all the classic American industries. Manufacturing, construction, agriculture, defense, service, banking, technology, and so on. Many of those people were helped by the GI Bill of Rights passed in 1944 which provided money and assistance for veterans to attend college and purchase homes and buy farms. My father, and maybe yours too, attended college in exactly this way. The GI Bill and other programs were direct government assistance, and this helped lift the boat, not just of those individuals, but their families and their communities, the businesses they created, and the tax base the government was then able to collect upon. Tax rates were progressive. The more you made, the more you paid. And as the economy grew and people made money, the government collected more taxes. And they built the interstate highway system. And they invested in shipping ports and airports and railways and dams, bridges, waterways, power and phone grids, flood control, and more. They were building on and continuing the work of the 1930s and the New Deal. These government programs were wildly popular for a prosperous post-war nation. And of course, not everyone benefited. Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Asian people were excluded from the GI Bill, excluded from assistance with home loans, excluded from many colleges, and excluded from many occupations. The Civil Rights Movement didn't start in the 1950s. It actually started 400 years ago. But in the 1950s, it got organized. It became politically powerful, and it rightly wanted a piece of the prosperity pie. There were civil rights acts in 1957, 1960, 1964, and 1965. These were not gifts of a benevolent government. By the way, these were hard-fought, hard-won bits of victory from thousands of activists and organizers and people of faith. Those last two civil rights bills in 64 and 65 made it illegal to discriminate when it came to public assistance. And, and I am apparently a very slow learner because it did not occur to me until very recently that the unpopularity of public assistance programs, especially among conservatives, the unpopularity of programs like the GI Bill and Welfare and Head Start and the Job Corps and food stamps and Medicaid-funded education and job training and direct food assistance and direct medical assistance, those programs really began to happen, or I should say, those programs really became unpopular among conservatives only after those services became available, became mandatory, mandatorily available to people of color. And the federal government began to enforce equal access. Now, all of that is a horrible oversimplification, of course. There were and are many other factors at play, and always what takes place in the United States is only a tiny fraction of the interrelated global community. Furthermore, there are some very intelligent people who would argue that the point I've just made about conservative politics turning against government assistance programs only when they became available to people of color, some would argue that is a correlation but not a causation. I would argue, though, that Given the real history of our country and the systemic racism built into the social fabric of this country, that denying that causation would be naive at best. And of course, this larger 
conversation continues. Between those who believe government has a central role in helping to create a more level playing field, creating policy and laws to help raise people up and out of poverty, to provide a social safety net and temper the excesses of racism, classism, and capitalism, and those who think social programs tend to benefit the unworthy and the government should stay out of social issues. And economies, of course, are complex things, and anyone who says they completely understand them in any kind of comprehensive way is either lying or delusional. And yet, and yet, there are trends, and there is history that can be studied for their lessons. And there are other ideas out there besides the way that we do our economy. The way our economy is set up is not the only way. Jared Bernstein wrote a book called All Together Now, Common Sense for a Fair Economy, in which he compares and contrasts two basic economic philosophies. The first one emphasizes hyper-individualism, and this is the prevailing view in the United States. He calls this model the yo-yo, which is short for you're on your own. And then he demonstrates the effects of yo-yoism, especially over the last 50 years. Sharp increases in the inequality of wealth, income, and opportunity. The other philosophy he calls wit, which is short for we're in this together. And he demonstrates that in the absence of a large-scale crisis like a war or a plague, Historical evidence clearly shows that effective programs to raise people and communities out of poverty end up raising the boat for everyone. Economies and policies that take care of the poor, create opportunities for everyone, are economies that grow. They grow in connectivity, they grow in happiness, and they grow in overall profitability. Bernstein wrote, and I'm quoting here, as yo-yoism rolls on, the amplitude of our national discomfort, the vague sense that something is fundamentally wrong in how we conduct our national and international affairs is climbing. In poll after poll, solid majorities view our country as headed in the wrong direction. In other words, he's arguing that we all know this about yo-yoism. We feel it but we rarely feel empowered to talk about it or even vote against it. Personally, as I have often said, I, I tend to believe the greatest con job of the last 50 years has been persuading millions of otherwise intelligent people that what's good for the already very wealthy is somehow magically good for all the rest of us. A lot of people just believe and assume that. Another important book on this subject is The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Us and How We Can Prosper Together. This is by economist Heather C. McGee. She argues against what she calls a zero-sum philosophy and worldview in which gains for some people inevitably must mean sacrifices or losses for others. This idea is deeply entrenched in American society and culture. And she uses the powerful image of a public swimming pool in Montgomery, Alabama to make her point. This was a pool, it's a real place, that was built with public money before World War II. It was, of course, for whites only. But in 1958, threatened with the possibility that the pool would need to be racially integrated, the city of Birmingham decided instead to drain it of water and fill it with concrete. In other words, if black people could use it, then nobody would be able to use it. Heather McGee cites numerous studies and economic projections that show that if racial equality were realized in the United States, if communities of color truly had equal access to education, health care, fair wages, and job opportunities, the net gain for everyone, for the whole country, for the treasury, for the stock market, for our ability to compete internationally, would be dramatically higher in every measurable respect. In other words, the heavily racialized zero-sum mentality 
that has largely taken over all political thinking in this country, both parties, like the concrete swimming pool in Montgomery, Alabama, has hurt everyone. The vast majority of white people, too, have seen stagnant wages, fewer jobs, pensions evaporated, less social mobility. In a much older book called The Market as God, Harvey Cox makes a compelling case that the way our culture treats capitalism has all the characteristics of a religion or even a cult. It has worshipers, it has acolytes, it has high priests and priestesses, it has its own mysterious scripture, and all of it revolves around glorifying the market, the great, mysterious, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent market. Harvey Cox isn't the only one to point out that actual Jewish and Christian scriptures have a specific word for this. That word is idolatry generally frowned upon. I'm suggesting a couple things with all of this. First, perhaps obvious, all of these things are interrelated. Racism, capitalism, zero-sum, yo-yo, the worship of market economics are all just different ways of articulating the same family of underlying assumptions and worldviews that are literally killing us and killing the planet that sustains us. Certainly, we need better economic policies when it comes to progressive taxation and the accessibility of education, health care, living wage, and housing. But we also need a whole different way of thinking about these things. We need to let go of the myopic and self-destructive view The gains for some people necessitate losses for others, and not just recognize, but celebrate the fact that we are, in fact, all in this together. We need to flip this script we've been sold, that what's good for the very wealthy is somehow good for the rest of us, which is patently false. And we need to make a very big deal out of the real truth, which is that what's good for the poor and the disenfranchised including the disenfranchised earth itself, that is what is socially, morally, materially, and spiritually good for all of us. At the risk of oversimplification, and to begin to wrap this up, I want to suggest two levels for not just thinking about this, but for living it. First, on a policy level, There's no mystery to what is needed at this point in time, and it's often referred to as economic justice. Economic justice includes things like progressive taxation, which is a partial remedy for wealth and income inequality. Economic justice includes a robust public infrastructure of education, health care, functioning representation in government, affordable housing, decent food, and so on, that are accessible to everyone. And that means everyone, regardless of race, color, ethnicity, class, language, gender, identity, sexual orientation, and so on, or the neighborhood you live on, everyone. Accessible to everyone. Economic justice includes environmental justice, moving towards a sane and sustainable relationship to the earth that sustains us. And it includes paying people a wage that can be lived on. Doesn't have to be enough to live in a high rise or a ranch somewhere, but it does have to be enough to survive and to allow access to all those other necessities I mentioned a second ago, like education, decent food, representation, health care, and so on. These are all things for which we can vote, we can work, we can stand up, and we can organize. Second, beyond or maybe beneath policies, legislation, and programs, we can move towards a social and cultural structure structure that also flips the script on 
the one we currently live in, that counters and makes irrelevant the hyper-individualism that creates all of this inequality. One that models and moves purposefully toward a more communal understanding. We are all in this together, and I suggest, as I often have before, that the quality of our lives is exactly equal to the quality of our relationships. No more and no less. In other words, show me someone whose close relationships with other people are characterized by knowing and mutual respect and mutual trust. And I will show you someone with a very high quality of life, even if they live on a dirt floor. Show me someone whose close relationships are characterized by emotional distance, mistrust, lack of respect, and I'll show you someone with a very low quality of life, even if they live in 20 beautiful rooms up in the hills above Aspen, Colorado. The pandemic of the last 15 months has shown us who is essential in this world and in this economy. Turns out we really need agriculture workers, and garbage collectors, and nurses, teachers, grocery store workers, truck drivers, tech support, child care workers, people who can maintain the water supply and electrical grid. These relationships are not trivial. They define us. And to the extent that they are built on mutual respect and mutual trust, they lift us all up. To the extent that they demonstrate a lack of respect or lack of trust, as demonstrated by the wages and accessibility of all those things I mentioned, that pulls us all down. That's how it works. Let's create a world where even Mark Zuckerberg and hedge fund managers and members of Congress from both parties understand that we all do better when we all do better, that we are all less hungry when we are all less hungry, that we are all more whole when we are all more whole. May we be the people who lead and show the way, and may it be so. Amen.